Hello, bonjour, and okay to everyone. and Welcome to Nonprofits at Two. I'm Karen Ball, President and CEO of CCBO. You know, I woke up this morning, like I have so many mornings during the pandemic, and was really overwhelmed with the weight of challenges that we are all faced with. And I know it's difficult to continue to do our work and to continue to move forward in this time. And for me, I have the privilege of working safely from home, from my home office where I am right now. But of course, that's not the case for so many of our frontline workers and so many of us in this sector. But along with that feeling of challenge, I also felt extraordinarily grateful for the incredible leadership and compassion from people that I see in this sector and the benefit from it every day in my own community and across the entire nonprofit sector in Alberta. So to everyone here today, I wanna to personally say thank you. Thank you for your work, for your leadership, for your bravery, for your compassion, and for the impact that you make every day on the prosperity of our communities. I and all of us are better for it. In addition to recognizing and honoring all of you that work within and support Alberta's nonprofit sector, we honor and acknowledge the land where CCBO is fortunate to call home, the traditional territory of Treaty 7, home to the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Gainai, Pikani, Zasutina, and Nekota nations, and Metis Nation Region 3. We, these nations have built prosperous communities on these lands for centuries. Today's gathering is presented by ATB Financial and is supported by the Mutart Foundation, PWC Canada, our media partner, Post Media, and our core supporters that make it possible for CCBO to strengthen our nonprofit networks and advocate for the needs of our sector every day. A few points about today's gathering. During the panel discussion that takes place over the first half of this session, you'll be able to submit questions for a live question and answer portion that takes place in the second half. At the end of the event, you'll also have a chance to answer a few short questions about your experience today. We hope you'll take the time to complete the short survey and share your thoughts with us so that we can ensure that Nonprofits at Two remains relevant and responsive to your interests and to your needs. And now, on with the main event. I have the distinct pleasure to moderate today's panel. So let me get right down to it um, with introductions and conversation. Joining me today are Jeff Loomis, Executive Director at Momentum. Momentum is a change-making organization that combines social and economic strategies to reduce poverty in Calgary, including working with different levels of governments to create a more inclusive local economy. Prior to joining Momentum over 11 years ago, Jeff worked with several community organizations in Calgary, including CAPS and the United Way. He has a degree in political science and a master's in environmental design from our University of Calgary and is a graduate of leadership and management training from Mount Royal University, Harvard School of Business, and Ivy Business School. Welcome, Jeff. Shivani Sani, CEO, founder, consultant, and producer at Atelier Culturati and founder of Kratos Empowered. Atelier Culturati creates inclusive content and powerful engagement, and is uniquely positioned to produce strategies, stories, and experiences that empower true inclusivity. Creatives Empowered is the first and only organization in Alberta for film and TV, media and arts professionals for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. With over 25 years of professional film, TV, and media arts experience, Shivani is a dedicated advocate for equity within mainstream media and the cultural sector. She holds a degree in radio and television arts from Ryerson University, my alma mater, and her portfolio includes groundbreaking museum content, award-winning television and film, cutting-edge theater, international visual arts affairs, social media initiatives, and festivals that cultivate new works. Welcome, Shivani. Dr. Alina Turner, co-president of Health Seekers. Health Seekers is a social enterprise focused on scaling systems and innovation to accelerate social change across Canada through using machine learning, data science, and social innovation to help people access services that improve their lives. 
a researcher and entrepreneur, Elena led the implementation of Canada's first homelessness management information system and designed Calgary's Housing First System of Care. She is a fellow, U of, C, fellow of the U of C School of Public Policy and serves on the board for Away Home Canada and the Alberta Rural Development Rural Advisory Board on Housing and Homelessness. Welcome, Elena. And Megan Reed, Executive Director at Vibrant Communities Calgary. Vibrant Communities Calgary is the steward of Calgary's Enough for All strategy for poverty reduction. Megan joined Vibrant Communities Calgary in 2019, bringing a diverse range of experience in organizational leadership, advocacy, collective impact initiatives, and policy change. She has served as the ED of the Brenda Stafford Center, Associate Vice President of Mental Health First Aid USA, and worked at the National Council for Behavioral Health in Washington, D.C., and as director of the Mental Health First Aid Program. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Mental Health First Aid Program and Mental Health Commission in Ottawa. Ha, ah, got it. Megan is a proud graduate of Memorial University of Newfoundland, where she studied economics and political science. Welcome, Megan. What a great panel. Um, welcome to you all. I'm really excited for today's discussion. Uh, just to kick it off, I. Um, when we gathered earlier last week, we were talking about why this discussion and why this time and at CCVO, um, as you know, and to share with the rest of them, um, our guests today, we do an editorial content meeting once a month. And we sort of look three or four months out and we think, what are our members telling us they want to hear about? What is our community at large talking about? What should we be presenting as content through things like our webinars or community of practice or um, events like nonprofits at noon. And so we were talking about how it's one year, or we will have just passed, and we have just passed the one year um, anniversary, anniversary of the pandemic. And what does that mean for us? And what is the space in which we should be having a conversation given that we're one year into a pandemic and that we're sitting sort of at this interesting nucleus where We've now had a year to sort of respond and react to everything that's been happening and the volatility and change that's been happening around us. But we can also sort of see the future now, maybe even more clearly than we have in a while, and at least start to sort of understand that there is an end to the pandemic impact, there will be a larger impact on the economy, and of course, the impact of the nonprofit sector um, will extend well beyond that, that time frame. So we wanted to bring this conversation together to really take a moment to figure out what it means to be in this space, um, to reflect on what has come before us, and also to consider what we take forward and how we address inequities that this time has surfaced that likely have been there for many decades previously and that we know now we, won't, we don't want to move forward under the current conditions that we were in when we came into the pandemic. So that's the sort of table setting for this conversation, what led us to bring all of you really smart, wonderful people together. So I have a, just a kind of opening question that I'd like you all to answer. So we'll, I'll go around, but the question is, um, reflecting back on this past year that has been, how has the pandemic affected your work? So within your organization and the work that you do, and also how has it impacted the people you work with and the communities that you serve? So what has been the impact over the past year specific to the pandemic in this time? And um, maybe if I could, I'll start with you, Shivani, and then I'll go to Megan. I had a feeling you were gonna start with me. <laughs> Uh, hey. It's really it's really great to be here. Thank you, Karen, for being our incredible moderator today. And it's uh, it's an honor to uh, spend this time in this virtual chat with all these incredible uh, guests and panelists. Um, so specifically on my side, in terms of my professional company, Atelier Culturati, prior to the pandemic, the bulk of my work actually involved working specifically in the arts, specifically working on live events. Um, and uh, I did a lot of work um, in terms of public relations, marketing, communication, social media, that type of thing, with a vested interest in trying to present narratives to the mainstream, to the public sphere, uh, to mainstream media that were often narratives that either were underrepresented or just wouldn't actually get any representation or airtime at all. 
Um, and that work uh, was, of course, incredibly fulfilling and, and rewarding um, and something that I'm still very passionate about doing. The reality is that as soon as the pandemic hit, shows that uh, I had booked, shows that my friends and colleagues, fellow artists, creatives had booked, um, just started getting canceled. Um, shows that were that had just started runs uh, had to come to abrupt ends. Um, and in terms of artists working specifically on that side, um, so many of us have been very hard hit. Um, I'm not necessarily an artist that, for example, will go on stage. Uh, I'm someone that works more behind the scenes, but there, there are also folks um, in other positions behind the scenes. There's an incredible, you know, um, technical capacity and crew and resource that's needed to often get a lot of live events up and to make happen. Um, so everyone that essentially is either on stage or behind the stage, helping to make what happens on that stage happen has been incredibly, um, has been impacted incredibly <laughs> in a very dramatic way. Um, there are many artists and, and arts organizations that have made incredible pivots to our online realm, which is very exciting to see. Uh, that also speaks to my personal background in film and television. Um, there's definitely exciting, um, exciting uh, opportunities there, exciting, um, uh, I think, creative uh, endeavors that are taking place. Um, but it's still all very exploratory uh, as we figure out what things will actually be like if we ever get to a place where we can say it's post pandemic and we all have a clear understanding of what that actually means. I don't believe it's gonna go back to the way that it was before. I think that we're going to be living in a different world that's gonna have an amalgamation of a lot of things from the online world we're in now and also um, that will pull in aspects of what our pre COVID world was like. Um, in terms of Creatives Empowered, um, Creatives Empowered was, in a manner of speaking, born out of the pandemic um, and resulted from a lot of the inequity that surfaced uh, during 2020. Thank you. Um, Megan, hear from you about what the impacts have been over the past year. Thank you, and thanks for having us. We're such proud CCVO members. And um, Shivani, I just so appreciate um, your mentioning the artists because we believe that arts and artists are such important, um, an important player in poverty reduction in our city as well. So coming into the pandemic, we were really fortunate to have this great enough for all poverty reduction strategy and a lot of momentum happening behind it. Um, and to contextualize for people, Prior to COVID, using market basket measure, in case there's any other um, economics nerds out there like myself, uh, there was about 189,000 Calgarians that lived in poverty. And what we know through some modeling is that throughout COVID, we've seen an additional 77,000 people fall into poverty. And within that poverty um, landscape, we know that a lot of people that have either fallen in or gone from uh, moderate to severe poverty have been members of racialized groups and that is hugely concerning and I know that everybody, um, my fellow panelists, um, are all very concerned about that as well. We recently did a study through the University of Calgary and our evaluator, Dr. Katrina Malini, to ask for stories um, from people living in poverty throughout this past year and what that's looking like. And while those statistics are really alarming, I think um, hearing some of the stories is, is really what has made us um, quite concerned. So stories of people skipping medication because they can't afford daily medication. People who are in situations where they feel like there might be violence, but they don't feel like they can escape because everybody's always home. Um, people whose mental health is really um, declining and they're not sure if they can reach out for help. Um, and even if they have the tools, aren't in a place where they feel like they can do that. And so that is the increasing worry that we're experiencing at Vibrant Communities around how do we keep connected to those people in a way um, that doesn't leave them behind as we all wanna quickly forget about what's happening. So um, with that though, I would say over the past year, um, we've seen a lot of pockets for hope 
there's a lot of pockets for hope. So people who've lived in poverty were our greatest teachers during a pandemic. They've always known how to navigate systems that didn't always show up for them in the way that they expected. Um, they've always known how to create community and to navigate complex systems in times of panic and rapidly changing um, environments. And to me, that is something that we need to pay attention to and listen to and to honor and remember as we move forward. And also um, from the indigenous community. So we're grateful settlers here in Mokinsis and how that community managed to come together to support one another was really inspiring and something that I think we should carry forward as well. Um, and, and also that we know when we have big emergencies, we wanna come up with big solutions. And so let's not stop that thinking as well. Thank you. <laughs> Just get myself unmuted there. I'm going to come back because I'm interested to hear some of the lived uh, experience of how Indigenous communities have responded to you through, through your lens and through your experience. But I like that both your, you and Shivani have talked about, you know, the hope, the ability to respond, the ability to be flexible and um, I guess when you live a lot of your life on your toes, like those living close to the poverty line and, and artists do, um, uh, you kind of learn to be adaptable and, um, and what that can teach us generally. So we'll come back to that. Um, maybe I'll hear from Jeff and then uh, Alina. So what, what has this year and its impacts meant for you at Momentum and the people that you serve? Yeah, I like to describe the impact of COVID as a wildfire. And I think when we think of a wildfire, it's destructive and it's destructive for, it was destructive for organizations and for people. And so at Momentum, like so many social profit organizations in our community, we had a huge loss of revenue. In the first month when COVID hit last year, we lost or delayed uh, about 10% of our organizational budget. And that was because we had a few um, trades training programs in particular that were scheduled to launch at the end of March last year and COVID hit, we couldn't launch them. And then we just lost that revenue. Um, so that was a huge challenge. We've also struggled with the well-being of our staff over this last year. So that's some of the destructive impact of COVID. Um, but there is like a wildfire, it creates an opportunity for renewal. And so there is a bit of a silver lining, I think with COVID and for us, that uh, opportunity for regeneration was the acceleration of our use of technology. And we had as a strategic priority to use technology better to enhance our reach and our scale. And it just was massively accelerated with COVID. And an example of that is we worked really hard to take our core money management work fully online. And it's now available in, a, in an on-demand way that people can take those money management courses at any time anywhere um, that works for them. And we're hoping that we'll have a thousand people this year complete those courses. So, and then with the impact on the community, I would really uh, agree with both Megan and Shivani about that. I think COVID amplified and exposed existing inequities and it just kind of brought it to the surface. Inequities that we know existed before based on research and just experience. And so we do really like the saying of, that became a little cliche, I think, but that with COVID, we were all in the same storm, but not in the same boat. And I know that people like Megan referenced that racialized communities, women uh, were more impacted. And an example that we experienced that is our first trades training program. And the vast majority of our trades training participants are racialized. They're pretty much all racialized because there's new Canadians and indigenous in our trades training programs. Uh, and almost all of the new Canadians are from communities or countries where they would be people of color. In our first race training program that we launched uh, after COVID, so it started in October, 16 of the 18 participants were recently unemployed and they were recently unemployed from survival jobs. So it showed that immediate impact of COVID. But as Megan said, there are pockets of hope and we have that group that started last October is graduating tomorrow and just before joining this webinar, I was talking to our staff and more than half of the participants are getting job offers as they complete the program, which we haven't seen results like that actually since like pre downturn, like not just pre COVID, but like pre 2015. So we're starting to see some pockets of uh, 
some green shoots, I guess you could say, and the cliche of some positive economic activity happening. Well, that's good to know. I can say that our Reach Hire Job Board has been very busy last month. So um, uh, postings and opportunities are starting to come forward through the nonprofit sector. We're seeing that in real time and also the shift to the digital reality. This used to be a luncheon at the Palliser. Remember that? So <laughs> now we get to do it in our bunny slippers. I'm not going to tell you if I'm wearing my bunny slippers or not. Um, <laughs> Alina, let's hear from you a little bit. Please. Well, speaking of bunny slippers, like there's <laughs> mine. So there you go. Um, and of course, Jeff steals all my cliches as per usual. Whenever we're on panels together, he always beats me to those punches. So I'll try to reserve those for later when something new comes to mind. Uh, so a little bit about my work or our work at Help Seeker and what's happened. And of course, with being in technology, of course, anybody that's been in technology in this space, uh, unless you've been under a rock, has been blowing up. And so for us, it's this really weird paradox where we're expanding so quickly and um, we're getting into this really awkward situation where all of our communities are suffering and losing jobs. So you're seeing the data come in and it's it was so interesting um, yet disturbing to watch the real-time trends coming out from across the country and the the theme is right when it hit it was food and we know that in the media but seeing the spike in the interactions for and people looking for food was so in, insane and then right after domestic violence and mental and then the mental health um discriminatory uh, human rights issues popping up in in the interactions what was interesting in us doing work nationally we're seeing that Calgary is not the same as everybody else, that there's localization that is so important to note in, in this work. And these, these waves are not consistent. Um, suicide was one of the, the things that was really concerning when we looked at what services were available for people uh, looking for suicide support and what was actually uh, being looked at and what was, what was in place. So the supply demand, uh, inequities were really manifested even stronger when people were looking for uh, supports that were specific to youth. So youth suicide prevention, very little stuff that pops up. And um, again, it's it's not just a Calgary problem, it's across the country problem. Um, and then of course, and you heard from my profile that I'm really active in the homelessness affordable housing side. And, and again, something that Jeff and I have in common there too because that has been a huge blow. Um, the weird paradox of the housing market blowing up during COVID has been something that not a lot of people anticipated unless you were really deep into, into those trenches for a while. And having watched the, um, and being involved in the homeless count right now, Help Seekers uh, working with the seven cities on, on the homeless count, what's happening in, in all the shelters and the, the outbreaks that have Pretty much been constant for um, vulnerable groups have been a huge huge um, um, huge pressure on on all those systems so that's kind of the the weird thing that you get to see when you're watching real-time data and you're responding in, in different communities but you, there's only so much you can do as a technology company and so our our challenge has been to influence policy decision makers to pay attention to what's happening with real-time data when the policy funding systems are set up for pretty old school uh, cycles of policy development and funding. So the, the funding that's going out isn't matching what the needs are. And even when you're presenting the data around what should be happening, the, the systems are not agile in their responses enough. So it's uh, it's it's really tough to do the, the work. I think the pandemic offers the opportunity for to challenge uh, policymakers to do business differently because the reality is co these emergencies are, are constant. Everybody that's worked in the nonprofit sector knows that it's a constant state of crisis. So to pretend that COVID is something unique from a crisis perspective is in inaccurate. It's always it's always a crisis when you don't have food to put on the table, when you're facing eviction uh, coming you know around the corner. So I I would say if we can 
the silver lining might be that the sense of urgency, I would love for that to stay because we've been able to do things that we thought would take us a decade to do, such as the federal buy-in for digitizing the social safety net. We've been pitching for that for years, for years, and to actually get a, a federal buy-in to get all services online and, and have that en masse across Canada wasn't there before. Uh, now, what can we do to take that to the next level to ensure that you know, that digital access is, is there for remote northern communities the same way that it may be for Calgary. What can we do to ensure adoption of digital uh, supports is consistent, that there's KPIs that we're monitoring on mass and doing something about because there's no point in collecting data if we're not going to use it to change policy and change systems. So those are the things we are really concerned and are working hard on. And uh, what I, I would say you have something new that might have not been uh, mentioned, just that national perspective that this is unfortunately not unique to Calgary, but there are some unique dynamics that are quite localized for us that we need to be paying attention to for sure. Uh, thanks and uh, also thank you for having me. Kim. That's my re reminder to be here, which I would have been late for if that was the case. So. <laughs> Well, we're really glad you're here and we're really glad you fought the long fight to digitize the social safety net because that's a game changer. And, um, you know, we do, at CCBO, we're really excited about what access to that kind of data uh, means for us and for uh, obviously those living in, in, in vulnerable situations that need the, the net. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously we have to build the system for the time of crisis and I think you're putting your finger on it when you say we're always in crisis, <laughs> just nothing new. Um, but I am interested now that we're in this kind of phase of saying, okay, what doesn't work anymore? And, and Alina, when you talk about like, it seems like things that would have been years in the making or lots of reasons why we couldn't do them before, suddenly, you know, barriers can be swept away quite quickly. And we're, I think, all realizing, well, this is, <laughs> this is how it should be actually that's, that didn't seem so hard now did it so let's take the next step um let's remove all the barriers uh, let's keep going so uh, as we begin to consider less the impact of the pandemic and more recovery i think um, you, and megan you're talking about seven thousand new calgarians that are now falling into poverty and what this might mean on the recovery scale um what do you see as being left out or not fully considered within pandemic recovery. And, and that might be from a government perspective or a societal perspective um, or however you want to kind of look at that. But what's not at the surface of what we should be talking about right now when we talk about recovery? And Megan, if it's okay, I'd like to maybe start with you on that question um, and then take it around for the, the panelists. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, so I, I always, you know, the voices of people who we are building solutions for are the people that need to be not just present at the table, but have the, the biggest, loudest seats at the table. So one of the things that we saw throughout the pandemic as we held community conversations with people who lived in poverty um, against each of our levers of change, like food security and housing, was that increasingly their experience wasn't lining up with the um, priorities of the decision makers. And so we need to sew those things together. And Karen, I, I love what you said about, you know, when we have the, the will and the urgency, we can really get things done very quickly. You know, we, they're not as fast acting, but we have vaccines against poverty. We absolutely do. Those things look like um, policies and practice around right, rights-based approaches to food and to housing. They look like really um, important and deep anti-racism work and practice. They look like a universal basic income, which should actually absolutely be on the table right now. Um, it looks like uh, changes in policy for you know anything that is gendered and includes women because we are in a she session. So these are vaccines. These are vaccines against poverty. So how do we approach those with the same urgency and get those on the table as realities um, as we move forward? Maybe just a follow-up question. Do you, when you talk about vaccines, I like this. Um, that's a great frame, vaccines against poverty. Because, I mean, we're all, we're all about the vaccines these days. <laughs> <laughs> but um, are you finding that those in the position to make the kind of policy to get those vaccines distributed are um, 
are, are responsive to that kind of uh, urgency? Um, that, that's a great question. And I would say um, that they are no more or less responsive than they always have been. And my greatest hope would be that we come out of this pandemic with a paradigm shift. You know, one thing that we sort of think about a lot at VCC is why we're celebrating things like how, how many pounds of food we've raised. Obviously, agencies who deliver food on an emergency basis are incredibly important um, and needed, but why are we celebrating that the other end of that means that there's thousands of hungry people? And when did that become so incredibly normalized in our society? right? Mm -hmm. Or that we have so many more affordable housing units. Well, the other side of that is people that are living on the street and don't have a home. Um, so I, I don't think that that urgency is necessarily any more pronounced at a decision-making policy or government level. Um, I think municipally, we've done some great work on the housing front. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I do challenge everybody who's watching to think about how we how we provide the same urgency to some of these problems um, that we would to a vaccine that gets us back to normal. And what does normal for everybody look like? Yeah, this is this is a once in a, hopefully I'm gonna knock on some wood or something, but a once in a lifetime <laughs> opportunity to shine a spotlight, yeah, yeah, on the work that we do and, and who, who needs the services that are provided. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jeff, can I put that question to you? So. What's not being fully considered as we start to think about um, recovery and building back? Yeah, I, similar to Megan, I'm a little worried that we've heard about the K-shaped recovery that could happen. So we had the exposure of inequities. And if we don't sort of pursue some of the vaccine ideas that Megan referenced, if we end up in a K-shaped recovery, those inequities are only gonna get worse. Um, I think the boom to the real estate uh, and that's real estate owned real estate, right? Not affordable housing development <laughs> real estate, uh, kind of reflects that start of a potential K-shaped recovery. And we know a lot of the contributors to the inequity, like the rise of precarious employment or the gig economy, those were already trends well before COVID. And if we don't try to have our economic activity work better so that we don't have those levels of inequity, we will leave more people behind. I think paid sick leave is a really tangible example that has become exposed during COVID. Um, and that's why it's ironic that actually CERB, I think, actually improved the financial situation of a lot of a lot of Canadians, including Calgarians, um, because we had huge rise of income volatility over the last decade plus. And CERB created the, the um, flattening of that volatility because it was steady and stable. So I really feel that uh, from a policy standpoint, one thing we need to think more about is how do we ensure that people are, that are living on low incomes, maybe struggling with stable income, how do they have financial cushions? So ultimately there can be less financial vulnerability. And a number of fairly comparative countries to Canada, the UK, New Zealand and Australia have all invested significant dollars as part of their recovery efforts in the financial health of their citizens especially people that are struggling on lower incomes and don't necessarily have savings and in canada we have very limited public investment in opportunities for people to build savings especially for people living on low incomes so the the best example of that is rrsps is probably the biggest policy mechanism to promote and enable savings well, RSPs work well for people living on middle incomes and upper incomes. They do not work well for people living on low incomes. So how do we take that similar policy approach of creating our RSPs and apply that for people that are much more financially vulnerable and that are struggling with income volatility? That would be a way that we try to ensure that people that are struggling pre-COVID and now even more so probably during COVID have the opportunity to not be left behind. Speaking of left behind, I think my mute button is going to get left behind, but um, <laughs> I, I have a follow up question to that, which is, you know, I think the shorthand maybe for a piece of what you're talking about, although I'm hearing you say that this is sort of distinctly different, is a universal basic income kind of approach, which is what when people much less uh, smart than you, like <laughs> on the outside of the work that you deal with every day might see as being um, something to advocate for from a solutions perspective. But you're talking about a savings perspective. So 
help me to sort of understand where universal basic income sits within what might be table stakes for building yeah. back better. So we're big believers in the quote uh, that is without an income, you can't get by, but without assets or savings, you can't get ahead. So for like something to be sustainable, it's so important to have the assets. That's your cushion in terms of a financial challenge. So that's why basic income is one of the potential solutions for stabilizing on the income side, but it doesn't solve the issue of financial vulnerability. And that's where creating opportunities for people to have emergency savings is part of the situation. Like we do believe that there's um, value in exploring basic income, but there's all, it's also really important that we think about how do we support good jobs? And that's where I think there's lots of things that we can do as individuals, as organizations, and not just government to be thinking about how do we support good jobs? So a tangible example is social procurement. Well, social procurement can be done as a as an individual. I can think about where I purchase and think about the hiring practices, the employment practices of the businesses that I'm giving my business to. But as social profit organizations, we can also think about how we're purchasing. Are we purchasing so that, that we're having the most social impact possible with that dollar? And I think there's a huge opportunity to think differently about how we spend. And that can be individually, that can be as an organization, and that can be at a policy level when it comes to social procurement. The city is now looking more at social procurement as an example at the city level. But it's so important that we collectively support the type of business activity that can result in better outcomes that are both economic outcomes and social outcomes. And there are now groups outside of, you know, there's the social profit space has been talking about how to do business differently uh, for years. But now groups like the Business Council of Alberta are starting to talk about social procurement as part of our recovery efforts and how hiring practices, uh, more equitable hiring practices can be part of our recovery efforts. So I think basic income is really critical for definitely some people, but it's not a panacea. We also need to think about like what are the, the way to have good jobs so that people can access good, stable income in an employment situation. Yeah, thank you. And Shivani, as someone that sort of works in the gig economy, with people working in the gig economy, with people that saw their entire um, year probably disappear overnight, and likely a lot of people without a lot of deep savings, not necessarily that RSP saving group of people in, in the art sector, but I mean, sometimes, but not universally. Um, what do you see in terms of who's been left behind and how we can move forward? And also I'm interested in um, how we can take advantage of our diversity um, in the city to be a leveraged advantage for us and, and not, to, and, and not mm -hmm. to be left, left out of how we think about moving forward. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think there, there are definitely artists that have, again, because of the pivot that has taken place to digital, to online, artists that have uh, fortunately been able to continue some of the work that they do. But it, the the amount of work and the budgets that would normally be associated with that work pre-COVID just aren't in place. And the reality is there are quite a few artists, quite a few creatives who are not working, who over the last year, in the time that the pandemic has been running, have actually had to just completely shift gears um, have had to find other sources of income, have had to also like move out of the arts to do that simply because the work wasn't there. Um, I think for quite a few artists um, who were at some point making a living wage pre-COVID through their work in the arts, um, so many of those artists absolutely relied on CERB and the CRB just to get them by uh, month to month to cover the bills to and and in some cases to cover the mortgages that they have that they have um, but uh, you know as we as we move forward I think the the concern that I have is when we get to a place where 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 arts spaces and organizations can continue to produce work and now start to put it out there um, are there are there going to be artists left? How how much of the arts workforce have we lost over the last year because they just haven't been given the support that they actually need? 
to be able to maintain themselves as artists, to be able to maintain the work that they're doing as artists. And so I, I think that there are some artists who probably have loved the, you know, the, the isolation that they've been given. Um, that might work well for some artists who love to create in that kind of isolation. But there are quite a few artists who, who need to create with others. And that's th that space just doesn't exist right now. We all have to do everything like this online. And, and if we can gather in person, th there are such restrictions on how that can happen safely that it's just not quite the same experience. So there's, there's a tremendous concern that, you know, when the arts and cultural sector can start to pick up some speed again and get back to more of the pace it may have had before COVID, that there's going to be a shortage of artists and creatives to actually step back into that work. Um, that is definitely um, a legitimate concern about what might be left behind. Um, in terms of diversity, in terms of inclusivity, in terms of equity, I can safely say that as someone who has worked in arts and culture for over 25 years, I started to see opportunities in 2020 that actually were rooted in a genuine interest to create true equity that I have never seen before in my entire life and that I never actually thought I would see in my lifetime. And so I'm incredibly grateful for the way that this pandemic has exposed, um, really exposed the inequities. And, and these inequities were always there, but there's just there was just something about 2020 that helped to raise the level of awareness, the collective consciousness that we had around what was actually going on in our world. That pause put us in a place where we could actually stop and take a really good look at where we were at, where everyone else was at, what's going on in our world, what matters to us, what isn't as important. Um, and, it, you know, of course, like there were also some key events that took place in 2020, such as the murder of George Floyd, you know, the protests that we saw worldwide that resulted from that, and rightly so. Um, you know, these, these catalytic events have set us on a course that I think is really exciting. Um, what I hope is that as we continue to move forward, that we can move forward in a way where that momentum and the urgency that's associated with it, that it's understood that this is not temporary. This is not temporary. This is not something that we're just doing right now because we feel like we should or we believe we have to. This is what we have to continue to do going forward at all times. We have to continuously put ourselves in a state of thinking about the true nature of the world around us, the land that we're actually on, whose land it is, who we're sharing it with, who, who else we continue to share it with in terms of who comes into the country that is called Canada, right? And as our population, as our identity, as a, as a, as a, as a community, as a country continues to evolve, um, we need to ensure that what we see in arts and culture is a continuous reflection of that of that identity of that population and we we have to work together to create that change that we need to see thank you i appreciate that as someone that's worked for over 20 years in culture in this province it's uh, terrifying to think that many that were in the gig economy as creators are not going to be doing that work moving forward or, or not going to have a home in our communities moving forward. I'm, I'm going to come back to you with a question about how we can maybe potentially address that. But I do want to give uh, Alina a second also to sort of chime into this idea of, <laughs> of uh, who's been left behind now. Uh, sure. So all of you said it so beautifully. So other than ditto, the things that I would echo a little bit further, the concept of social enterprise and social procurement, I think that's such a such a potential out of this as well, because that encompasses the equity piece in practice. So the way social enterprises are meant to hire, to train, to uh, develop product, to develop services is, is and should be different than kind of the typical mainstream corporate approach. And I think that could be something that um, hopefully doesn't get left be behind. Uh, help seekers actually 
product, if you will, of Momentum social enterprise program. So we are uh, one of those success stories that came out of uh, something homegrown in Calgary. And, and I'm hoping that we see more of that out of this work because that's, I truly believe that's the future. Um, and the reason for that is also because to the point of, you know, where is this going to go long term? Ultimately, we still have this huge problem in Calgary around uh, diversification. The oil and gas uh, situation is, you know, so there's some glimmers there, but it's not going to be what it what it was. And who's going to be left behind? Those inequities are going to be further widened. So I think we have a huge role to play to sh carve that path forward for what social profit means moving forward and putting our dollars where our mouths are. So as a tech company, social enterprise, we're hoping that we can compete with the big tech firms. But the only way we're going to compete as a small Alberta based enterprise is because people are choosing to purchase technology that's locally owned, that is acknowledging equity in our data sourcing. You know, the whole concept is is through and through has to have an equity lens. And the only way forward to, to do that is to ensure it's part of the recovery um, strategy as well. So I, I would definitely echo that. The other component around technology is part of the diversification model for Calgary as well, is that technology is not just about agricom or um, medical technology. I think there's a huge potential for social technology out of Calgary. I mean, we're, as far as we know, are one of the only social tech companies out there that's again homegrown in calgary something that's now been nationally adopted with potential to to be out out of canada in the next year so there's i think huge huge opportunity for us to carve a path for calgary that's unique niche but creates jobs that are really well paid like in technology you don't get minimum wage yet we hire people that were low income and train them in technology jobs to to have an income and take care of you know we've got people moms single moms that have five kids on our team and things that weren't there before so having some options for calgarians that that are different than the old economies is going to be so important moving forward so i really think that calgary has has something to offer um that is that's hopeful out of this and in, including artists right like video animators and uh, folks that have that artistic capability in the there's lots of opportunity in the digital space to diversify their uh, potential repertoire or contributions in uh, long term and, and future proofing their skill sets is going to be really important for for Calgary long term too. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like one more very quick question and then we're going to go to take questions from um, those that have joined us here today. So if you do have a question for the panelists, um, make sure that you're typing it in the question box and sending it through and it'll uh, auto magically come to me and I'll ask the panelists. But uh, I have one more of my own questions, which is, um, Elena, you talked about, you know, uh, picking up on what Jeff was saying about social procurement and the use of social technology and diversifying the economy. So from everyone here, maybe quickly, um, what is a, something you're seeing on the horizon or a solution-oriented kind of uh, policy or something that we should be considering and putting into place now that tangibly is going to help serve people that have been left behind or have been further uh, push to the margins through the pandemic. So I know Help Seekers is a kind of a living example of um, one of these future-proof solutions. Um, and and feel free to talk a little bit about Help Seekers and what it does, but also if there are other things that you think aren't in the landscape now that should be added in or that we need to be thinking of from a solutions perspective. Um, if you're asking me, okay. I am. Okay. I'll start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll start and I'll, I'll speak more, maybe more broadly about technology and, and social innovation, just so that it's not all about us. You can feel free to, to Google us and, and see what we do at your leisure. But um, in terms of what can government do around supporting this B Corp movement and social enterprise movement, I mean, government is a huge purchaser, right? And right now, the major purchasing power is used in, in potentially not the most uh, localized solution, small businesses, SMEs, 
you always hear that, well, you know, you're, we're going to go with X because they're multinational. Well, that's not, so you're taking our tax dollars and you're purchasing something multinational that is accused of being discriminatory and anti and, and not ethical. Well, so use your money, as, as Jeff so greatly said, put your money where your mouth is. Uh, so from a policy perspective, that's a really easy thing. Well, I'm, I know it's not easy, trust me, but um, that is something that, that is not requiring more money, right? It's the same money you were gonna spend anyways, but can you do it to create good jobs, future-proof your economy, diversify your economy, build product that can take Alberta to the international stage to bring in additional capital to further diversify us outside of this oil and gas um, sector that, that will continue to be important, but is not going to be the only thing that is part of the Calgary future. Um, what else would I like to, to see? I mean, there's a lots of these policies that have been floating around for such a long time. The vaccine analogy is great. I think there's an additional element that we're now seeing out of the data that we didn't have before. And that has only been possible because of the open data movement for a long time. So lots of these inequities have, have been really masked by aggregate data. So the, the racialized um, um, approach to even machine learning has been to essentially whitewash the machine learning um, algorithms and remove racial bias by just not talking about racial bias. Well, that's not doing any justice to anything. So I think there's there's lots of work that can be done on the on the data side to continue to keep this stuff on on the front burner. Uh, and the only way to do that is by making it visible. And again, that's that's I know it's not easy to do, but it's not necessarily more money. It's a different way of looking at at the same data and asking about data in different ways. So things that that we can do there are, are around unleashing data or uh, freeing up data, democratizing data, so that it's not just the big tech that's that's doing the work. That we've got some innovative thinkers, that diverse thinkers that are able to to uh, um, to do work on on this data and bring AI, bring machine learning to these solutions. We just finished a project through the digital supercluster that looked at predicting homelessness, domestic violence, and suicide using machine learning. And uh, we partnered with a, another Alberta uh, firm on that, Alta ML. And like the fact that it's now possible to predict social issues, can you imagine what that means for public policy that we can predict homelessness? So that is a game changer as well. But are yeah. policymakers able to absorb that in their policy development cycles to actually get ahead of these issues? And the reason why it's really tough, of course, is that the, the way that the machinations of, of the state have continue to develop over time, have created a huge fragmentation in the social safety net. And that fragmentation, unfortunately, or fortunately, we're part of that fragmentation. And nonprofits, charities, social enterprises, and social enterprises were like this really tiny sliver of that. It's primarily charities and nonprofits. We benefit from the fragmentation. So we have an implicit bias to reproduce this system. And that's a humongous challenge to all of us to remove to remove that bias and and to think critically about our own role in in reproducing inequities that's a tough thing that's a really tough thing to say actually i'm maybe i'm not i don't need to exist anymore even though we always say we want to put ourselves out of business the truth is we're billions of dollars in business right now so how are we transforming ourselves and looking at ourselves critically as a sector to to move the dial and I don't have the answer, but I know I have the data to talk about the these challenges and and oh, at least open the dialogue moving forward. Thanks. Yeah, and you, thank you. And you put your finger on something that's really critical: that it is not a solution that exists only for government or only for the nonprofit sector or only for the private sector. It is a solution that has to exist. Solutions have to exist across sectors, and we have to sort of see them in that way too. I think as a society. Um, Megan, do you want to add into, you know, tangible things that we can do to, to actually build back better? For sure. Um, so a thousand percent agree with um, social procurement policies. Um, just launching on what you said, Alina, in terms of data um, and gig work, um, to your point, Shivani, you know, recommending that Statistics Canada collect more information on gig work and precarious economy and then start to orient policies that can Keep people out of poverty when they're in that work. 
Um, I would also advocate for supporting living wage policies over minimum wage policies as a way to get people out of and to stay out of poverty. Um, and I think we also need to look at, um, particularly in our province, some, some reforms in terms of income support and who can work and what some of the barriers are. And locally, let's talk about bringing an equity framework to our city planning and neighborhood investment in a really meaningful way. And I think those are really tangible things we could easily do right now. if We have the same will that we have around lots of other things, so. Yeah, we've already decided that it's easy to do things now, right? Did we, did we collectively decide that at some point in this conversation? Yeah, I love the equity frame to how we plan our cities and our spaces. Um, and starting at the community level, so fundamentally important. Um, Shivani, I, I know we, I, I expressed my, my personal fear that our cultural sector um, is damaged in a way that is gonna be resonant for a very long time. What can we be doing now to, in response to that? Yeah, I, think, um, I think it would be great to find ways to connect with artists and creatives to to just hear what their experiences have been you know um it, it the the data work that is involved in um the work the other panelists here are doing is incredible i wish there was some way to have that same type of data collection in the in the cultural sector um it would be great to get a sense of what artists and creatives need right now and what they need so that they can be sustained in a way that will allow them to be able to continue to work as artists and creatives when we can get, safely get back to that place to do that. Um, I think in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the equity, diversity and inclusion lens, I think that a tremendous amount of work has already been done within 2020 and I would love to see that continue. I would love to see the momentum of that continue. Um, I think that everybody everybody plays a role, and I, I appreciated what Alina had also said about you know just taking the opportunity to to also check in with ourselves, to check in as individuals to see what we could actually be doing. Um, you know, there is a plethora of information that exists online. No shortage of books. No shortage of resources that one can access and um, and it, and gather so that they can learn what they need to learn and be able to um, contribute in a positive way to create that kind of change we need to see in terms of equity um, just trying to think if there's if there's anything else um, I I would love to reiterate um, the, the sentiment that has brought, been brought up throughout the discussion about a basic living wage. Um, it, it, I think that a basic living wage, of course, would be helpful, incredibly helpful to artists and creatives. It's something that they obviously have been accessing, but it, it would be incredibly helpful, of course, to, to folks in other sectors as well. Um, it, it really has been quite, uh, quite incredible to see how for some artists and creatives, just being able to access serve or CRB has made all of the difference. Like the sense of relief that I've seen from some artists and creatives, um, just simply by the fact that CERB and CRB uh, was put into place and it was something they could access, uh, you know, is, is pretty profound. Um, yeah, perhaps, I don't know, perhaps there are ways we can collaborate together on the data collection that's obviously needed in the cultural sector. Yeah, I appreciate that. I know that uh, Calgary Arts Development's been doing a bit of uh, experience economy data collection, which is a little bit broader, but um, we certainly know that many, many of the workers just outside of the cultural sector and broadly within the nonprofit sector that are frontline workers um, are not making a living wage and don't have things like sick leave. And so this is creating, you know, additional stress and additional problems problems within our own sector. So um, to your point, Alina, I mean, at some point, you know, looking within too, to sort of address some of the inequities that our own systems have put in place is, is going to be necessary to building back. Um, Jeff, what are your thoughts around tangible uh, solutions? So you, you're the one, I think, that initially tabled social procurement, which we talked about a bit today. 
Yeah, and I swear I did not know Alina was going to be so supportive of social procurement. But um, yeah, I I do think social procurement is, can be a powerful tool because it can apply at the multiple levels. Um, it can be right at that individual level all the way up to organizational and government. So uh, I really appreciated Alina's comment around that we are as social profit, not for profit organizations, part of a system and that we're connected into the larger public systems. And there's a quote, I'm going to um, probably paraphrase it poorly, but it was from an MIT prof that systems create the outcomes that they were designed to create. And that's why it's so hard to create systems change because like the systems are designed to create an outcome, whether it's the outcome you actually want or if it's an unintended outcome, but it is by nature of the design of the system. And so it takes that individual action, individual as a person, you think of like from system change standpoint, like how you frame an issue, that's about you as an individual. And that's the first step towards systems change. And I think we're starting to see that in the reconciliation journey uh, in our country. So it does take individual action and then it does take um, more of an organization level action, especially getting at the system changes that Alina was referencing that we're part of how our social safety net is delivered uh, in our country. So I thought that was a really uh, profound comment that kind of made my head just go. But uh, the last thing I would just mention that I think we can do differently in that spirit of working so that people can get good jobs. And I think it like we need to do a better job of a good job. So procurement is just one way of like creating an incentive for the good job. But we also need to really focus on how we train better or retrain better as a country so that people can then access better jobs. And right now, the federal government is putting major new investments into training and retraining. But our provincial government, uh, with those transfer dollars of the federal government, is largely focused on training people to get jobs, but not necessarily having an equity lens of who are the people that were struggling before COVID hit or before our oil and gas downturn hit. We have a bit of an obsession right now in our province and for some good reasons, some justifiable reasons of like retraining people from the energy sector. Yes, that's important. However, there's a lot of people that didn't work in the energy sector before the economic downturn who were struggling, who could benefit from training that then enables them better opportunities to get a better job. And so I really feel that we need as a, as a province and as well as as a country to really think of how do we prioritize for some of the people most struggling in the labor force that can work. Not everyone can work. I totally get that. But the people that can work, how do we try to train, provide the training opportunities so that they can get better jobs? And right now we'll see any day now, the Alberta government is supposed to announce their Alberta jobs now and provide the details to it. It was announced in the provincial budget, is largely funded with federal transfer dollars. And let's see if, if that is, if it's only gonna focus on people that are already close to the labor market, being able to get back into the labor market, it will have some benefit, but it will leave some people out and leave some people behind. So I think we really need to think about how can we prioritize training or retraining for people that um, have historically been marginalized in the labor market. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, we do have a question from our audience. So I'll, I'll put it to you now and um, whoever wants to chime in, maybe just just feel free to unmute and go for it. But um, with so many adult needs in the spotlight, do you imagine our community ever getting upstream to address the needs of young children who have been significantly impacted? Little ones grow big and their problems become more complicated and costly. can start us off if we want. One of our um, champions, Calgary Reads, um, has a great stat that um, if, if children by the age of grade three haven't learned so many words, they aren't at a certain grade level reading of reading, that their likelihood of um, falling into poverty when they're adults is significant. You can predict it at grade three, right? And so, um, there is a, a huge challenge in terms of all the children who have missed out on words and learning in our community um, up to now because of the pandemic, for example. So um, 
I do think there's a lot of hope to tackle the upstream and the systemic change while we continue to meet those basic needs. And it's the better investment. The systems change is the better investment. The return on that investment is lifelong. And um, you know, there's that saying, the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago, the next best time is now. So let's let's plant that tree. Thanks, Megan. Um, does anyone else want to add into that? Um, we have another question, so maybe I could put that on the table as well. It's uh, it's really. I can do a really quick comment, Karen. Is that um, we don't sure, at yeah. Momentum kind of work with uh, with um, children and youth, especially under eighteen. But it's a totally fair point that we have to look upstream, and that's you can't look more upstream than kids. And just one tangible example where we can do a better job as a country is making sure there's good access for as children and youth go through the k-12 system that they can access different forms of post-secondary and that it's affordable and that people young people can have that as part of their goal because we know that there's huge difference in terms of the economic um, benefit of going to at least some level of post-secondary uh, and that not just university like trade school and this is an example or community college not just university the stats the research shows it's a huge impact from a lifetime earning standpoint and we also know from research that a child is seven times more likely to go to post-secondary if they have an education savings account in their name wow. well in canada we have the canada learning bond which is now 18 years old the first kids that received a Canada Learning Bond 18 years ago, will be finishing the K-12 system uh, next year, I think it is, um, in 2022. And so the Canada Learning Bond is a great tool because it reduces that financial barrier to go to school, post-secondary, and it creates the expectation that you can go uh, to school. However, Calgary, we've done a pretty good job over the last 10 years of increasing the Canada Learning Bond uptake as a community. And we went from below 20% uptake uh, 10 years ago to now we just hit 50% uptake. So that's a really good news story. And the other slide you could look at it is like, well, there's still 50% of kids that are eligible, low income families in Calgary and area that don't receive the Canada Learning Bond. So I think there's a big opportunity. We're doing some research with the Max Bell Foundation support right now of how can we increase the uptake of the Canada Learning Bond across the country um, to really scale it from the 50% to ideally, obviously, every single child in Canada would have an education savings account in their name so they could have the the dream of going to post-secondary and have it be more of a reality. So that's just a, a tangible example of focusing on kids for the long term. Yeah, that's a beautiful future. That's a country I want to live in, for sure. Um, I, uh, there's a couple, so I don't know, I'm sure some of you are policy nerds, so <laughs> just out yourself right now. Um, but there is a question about policy. So I'll put it to you. Um, what do you see as the most productive policy that can be moved forward in ensuring we leave no one behind, federal or provincial policy? So where should we have our eye when we look to policy right now? Alina, go for it. Sure. So for sure, the the piece that that's been so encouraging is the national housing strategy. I, I still think the full uptake of that is going to be really important, especially when the federal government gets into uh, monetary trouble and in, in recovery. So ensuring that that focus on the national housing strategy from a rights perspective is maintained. Uh, the other one that I, I would be remiss to not talk about is the, the gender based violence work at the national level that's setting the agenda around uh, violence against women, but also violence against um, children and, and marginalized groups as well. So there's, and you mentioned the piece around children as well and adverse childhood experiences. We, we know where this is going early on. So um, the daycare work or the, the policy around childcare, access to childcare, the feminization of poverty, all those pieces I, I would continue to, to keep an eye on. Uh, federally as well, and the universal basic income. I mean, we're we're moving into this fourth industrial revolution, whether we like it or not. So we're whether it's for take away poverty, take away um, that lens. Look at it from a self-interest perspective, and your children and their children's children. We have to get there, 
we have to figure that out because the, the, the future of work is not what it is today. And so how we set ourselves up for this next iteration of humanity now with an equity lens now is, is going to be the game changer. So that is not just federal policy, that's international policy. That's how we interact with, with some of these big data corporations as well. And, and what data sovereignty looks like for the Canadian people, what it looks like for Indigenous people. Those are conversations that are critical. Data, you know, people have said it, data is the new oil. Data, I mean, oil's got nothing on data, really. So those are the conversations I would be really paying attention to uh, moving forward. But that's, I'm sure, there's lots, lots more as well at the provincial and uh, local level that colleagues will chime in on. Thanks. Yeah, that's amazing because you're putting your finger on a couple of things that we don't talk about every day, but are fundamentally important. Um, who else wants to maybe chime in on this one about hard policies that we should we should be advocating for now? I, I'm putting the word advocate in there. <laughs> Well, Karen, Megan referenced the change to income support at an Alberta level. And there's big change like basic income that would obviously be beneficial at a federal level or provincial level. Um, pragmatically, probably not gonna happen. Like, I know it's a little bit cynical, but you know, I just don't think it's gonna happen. So there is pragmatic change that a number of organizations in town through what's called the Social Policy Collaborative, we've been advocating to change the earned income exemptions for income support. Right now, our income support rules basically create a disincentive or a penalty for people to start earning money from employment while they're on income support. And the proverbial way it's described is the welfare wall that mm -hmm. at a certain point, it just doesn't make sense to try to start working because you lose too many benefits. And so there's a great opportunity to smooth out the transition from income support benefits into employment income and potentially never leave income support benefit, but supplement your income from employment by just increasing the earned income exemptions. And we did work with the UC of School of Public Policy that shows it's not actually gonna cost the government that much, uh, if at all. And so that's one really tangible uh, policy change that could pragmatically actually be done because it doesn't have a massive cost and could have a very significant benefit for people on income support. Thanks, Jeff. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that CCVO is is working on some advocacy around social infrastructure funding. So we are anxious to see the government of Alberta um, divert uh three and a half percent of its overall alberta recovery plan towards social infrastructure programs and services that help society function um right now the alberta recovery plan is very thin on ways that uh, we can equitably recover for everyone and so what we're suggesting is that they take um 350 million dollars of their 21 billion dollar capital uh, budget expenditure and divert it to social infrastructure from capital infrastructure creates three times as many jobs, tends to be jobs for women and people of color, and obviously would uh, be jobs in the social sector that would be able to be focused on recovery as we move forward. So there's the plug for CCPO if you're interested in that work. Um, follow us along on our policy uh, tab on the CCPO website. Um, Megan, did you have other policy uh, pieces that you wanted to contribute with? Yeah, I would uh, absolutely agree with Alina and Jeff, although Jeff, you're breaking my heart. I do think a universal basic income is possible um, and I'm not ready to rule it out yet, um, but certainly um, policies around childcare and housing are important. An approach to policy that is more of a justice orientation than a charity orientation around things like food is critical. And I'll also put in a plug for um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendations. There's a number of linked policy asks that are held within those that jurisdictions at many levels can take. Um, and I think now is is a really important time to um, to really meaningfully engage in the TRC process. So maybe I'll follow up because there is actually a question about incorporating Indigenous learning and knowing. And um, Megan, you had brought it forward in the beginning. And I don't want to, we don't have an Indigenous panel member, but um, from your perspective, I think this is a question that's come up from the audience, which is, um, Sometimes it seems that the Indigenous way of learning and knowing is applied to things like Indigenous programming. 
but how can we build back better by incorporating those ways of knowing and learning across all sectors and within organizations and systems to incorporate better design and thus be more holistic in our outcomes. So um, maybe this is an opportunity to talk about some of the points that you brought up at the beginning around Indigenous ways of knowing and approach. Sure. Um, and I am a settler, so I don't, um, I'm not sort of speaking for anybody, but um, from a, a poverty perspective and our perspective at Vibrant Communities Calgary, I mean, if we're talking about systems and organizations, our roadmap is there. It is the TRC. We don't need to learn more. We just actually need to take that and do. Um, and then in terms of my experience, there was a group, um, a really amazing collective called the Seven Brothers Circle, um, which is Indigenous led, uh, that started right after the pandemic hit. And so it looks at things like mental health, housing, income support, basic needs, technology, there's circles within that seven brother circle. It was incredible to see A, how quickly that came together, um, the strength of community connection and caring, the different way of working that wasn't like, if we have done A and haven't done B, then we've succeeded or failed and really getting out of that paradigm to keep innovating and finding solutions. And from my experience, you know, we met we met this morning um, at the Seven Brothers Circle of, of the many task forces and strike forces and all the forces that spun up. This is the one that has is going, has maintained, is looking strategically. Um, and I think it's because of that Indigenous way of knowing and working, what kind of knowledge that we value. So we don't need to um, write it on paper, or get it researched. I mean, that's also important. But when we value lived experience and when we value tradition and history to inform our future, that is critical in the in poverty reduction work and rights-based work. And so I think that there's there's a lot there. It's not just for indigenous space, but how are we all incorporating that into our practice? I think it would really make us all much more effective. Thank you. And Shivani, did you want to contribute to that question as well? I know that you've had some experience with the Making Treaty 7 Society and um, culturally through an Indigenous lens? Uh, yeah, I think I think that uh, what I can add as, uh, as someone who is South Asian, as a person of colour, um, it, it is just the simple idea and notion that there is inherently more than one way of seeing and being and knowing. Um, there, there are so many different perspectives that can be incorporated into any given system. Uh, there's, I think one of the things that Megan talked about earlier in our conversation was this incredible opportunity we have right now to create some real paradigm shifts. Um, and when I think about that, really the way that I view it is that we're, we're talking about creating new systems really, when we talk about paradigm shifts. Um, there are things within the existing systems we have that can certainly be looked at that obviously need to be worked with that you know we can try to improve. But there is a tremendous opportunity right now because of this pandemic to see what other systems we can come up with that in fact might actually serve everyone better. That is in fact one of the reasons why I started Creatives Empowered. It, it was intended to be a space for BIPOC, uh, EPOC, racialized artists and creatives um, that they just didn't have before. Um, and I think that, um, I think it's really great also to just understand that if you, if you just um, approach things with an open heart and an open mind um, and you try to be as respectful as you can to the people around you and to the, uh, you know, uh, the world around you and the land that you're on and, and also just paying respect to the land that you're on and understanding really where you are uh, and who the traditional peoples of that territory are. Um, I think that relationship building can go a really long way to not just perhaps giving you greater insight on your existing systems and what does and doesn't work, but can also feed in quite nicely to perhaps creating these paradigm shifts that I think many people probably would be quite interested in seeing. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it should be at our, to our greatest advantage 
that we have this thousands of years of history that we can um, learn from as settlers, I think. Uh, it's certainly been part of my learning journey and experience. Um, we have one last question. And um, I think we have time for one last question. We have one last question. It's the perfect storm of panels. So um, I'll put it out there. It's about labor laws, because everyone likes to end on a good question about labor laws. So here it is. Um, is there an opportunity to modernize labor laws to increase flexibility and protect workers? Um, so I know we all have sort of touch points into this maybe question, but uh, who might like to tackle it? Oh. Megan, is labor laws an area that um, that you work at at BCC? <laughs> um, you know, it's coming for you. Focus, but I, I would bring it back to the gig, gig economy and precarious work. It's really concerning that we don't, we really don't know enough about this to make informed policy decisions about it and um you know i i think there's an increasing sort of exploitation of that workforce and we know that in calgary particularly there, it's a little unique there's even more racialized people in the gig economy than in other places although it's certainly a predominant feature um uh, it's it's massive and so if we look at labor laws how are those um, gig workers being protected how are they able to um, both survive, but then, as as Jeff points out, to also save and protect against their future. Um, how do, how do we ensure paid sick time um, and those sorts of things? The other thing I'll I'll say around labor laws is that um, you know we've seen this in the pandemic. Um, meat meat um, meat packing plant processors, people that work there, people that work in long term care facilities. We're talking about you know sort of minimum and not living wage workers who are largely unprotected who we're absolutely like the frontline essential people. And so how are we changing laws to, to reflect how we take care of them, pay them for sick time, allow people to be off, not tie programs to residency or immigration status, all of those things, I think need to be examined um, quickly along with the gig economy work. Thank you. And Alina, do you in your work have any intersection between data and labor law? So, I mean, for sure, the, the gig economy has been the big, big thing on the on the radar for it because of ex exactly what you, what you all have, have have mentioned. And it's happening not just in in low in traditional low income sectors, it's happening in, in in actually white collar work as well. So that, of course, the, the challenge is that our government is really second on on these on these approaches to managing the gig the big gig firms that are leading the pack on this on this approach so usually canada because we're not a big player in terms of uh, monitoring these multinational um, technology firms that are like the ubers or the um those folks that that are have that really large workforce i mean the way forward it truly is uh, back to the procurement stuff, if you know, support support um, technology firms that have uh, that respect labor laws that don't have this approach to to their labor force in the immediate term, right? Like that's stuff that you can choose to do. And there are rivals, for instance, that the right sh there's right sharing, there's grocery delivery that are rivaling these big uh, technology firms that are doing this on a more localized and a fair way. And are are actually really interesting approaches to to tackle that. But if we choose to keep purchasing that way, then we're part of the problem again. And I'm, yes, I order. <laughs> I'm part of the problem too. So I I totally get it. The other one is that um, you know how how we create jobs in the technology field that are not just not just survival jobs that are actually flourishing jobs that can take somebody out of poverty upskill them into the technology sector to bring them up to that sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars a year um, job like that's doable that's not hard to do those are jobs we have a hell of a time hiring um job the technology folks that we need so there's and interestingly technology jobs actually bring in lots of racialized folks that are that for lots of reasons really love stem so there's 
there's actually opportunities to diversify um, our workforce as well because of who we're bringing in. But we need more of those kinds of jobs to do that. And we need more for firms that or technology companies that are localized, that are respecting labor laws to do that. And that is a policy decision that to encourage to invest in, in companies that are that are doing that versus bringing in the kind of these multinationals. And that's, again, not just a Canada problem. It's a problem everywhere. Mm -hmm. I would say out of all of us, the EU has done the best job. Uh, through the antitrust um, legislation work that they've done to to do exactly to tackle on some of the the delivery um, gig economy, the ride sharing gig economy, that is definitely. Um, now, on the other hand, if we wasn't for them, there would be a lot a lot of folks who don't even have that. So you really do need all of these policy mechanisms. It's not just one one thing. That yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Super. Super quick, Karen. Um, yeah, sure, the employment yeah. standards slash labor laws for Alberta were updated and revised quite significantly not that long ago. So labor laws are generally provincial jurisdiction in Canada, mm -hmm. and the NDEs did a big push on updating the employment standards, and they haven't changed that much since the UCP government came in. Uh, they didn't address a lot of the gig economy issues, so there's still room for improvement there, but. Um, the employment standards were relatively recently updated. Thank you. And I think this is bringing us to just enough time for me to kind of wrap up and do my very final housekeeping. So um, thank you all for participating today. And it's been such a pleasure to talk with you and to hear your deep and meaningful perspectives into this topic. I. I actually took a ton of notes myself. It was hard to moderate and also take notes for my own purpose, but um, I got a lot out of the session. So I'm, I'm sure that the guests that joined us today did as well. Um, I look forward to moving forward collectively with you all and with everyone as we build back better. So thank you very, very much for joining us today. Uh, we will be following up for everyone that's on the uh, chat today with an email, with more resources, with links to more about the panelists and with some of the things that they're reading and are interested in that deepen our understanding of this topic. So please look for that. So with that, I would like to invite everyone that joined us today um, to come back for one of our CCBO upcoming programs. So our next program will be um, Branding Shifts in the Nonprofit on April 29th. Uh, strategies to be seen and heard through the online no noise presented by Kirsten Hewer from Nonprofit Today. And then our next nonprofit at two, Merging for Good and Exploration of Learning from Recent Mergers, Trellis and Dress for Success with Making Changes, as well as what funders and other supporting stakeholders are working on to support exploration around mergers, partnerships, acquisitions, and stewarding what may be lost through the process. So um, be sure to join us for those two upcoming sessions. If you're interested, we'd love to have you here. Um, thank you again to our presenting sponsor, ATB Financial, and to the, our supporters, the Muttart Foundation, PWC Canada, and our media partner, Post Media. Thank you to everyone that attended today. Thank you for everything you do every day. Um, to our panelists and our supporters. Uh, and also I wanna give a quick shout out to the CCBO team, Marissa Barber, Mary Polychronis, and Maroki Osatashi for all your work behind the scenes today. Thank you, thank you. Um, please take a moment to complete the short survey that you'll see pop up after today's session. And in case you don't get a chance to share your feedback, check your inbox for the survey link. We're just gonna bombard you, it's still coming, but we do get a lot of great ideas for panels out of the feedback that you provide us with. So it's deeply um, and deeply meaningful for us and how we can respond to the kind of topics that you wanna hear about. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and I hope you can join us again soon. <laughs>